Okay. All right. So uh, this is the sixth meeting of our studies together in contemporary Jewish uh, theology in America. And we're going to be uh, taking what they call, I guess, a hermeneutical turn or a theological turn um, towards um, people who were born in America, maybe students of the uh, uh, people that we had studied in the first uh, several sessions, uh, but people who really represent uh, the American, contemporary American Jewish experience, or at least two representatives of that um, who are writing theology. So uh, that is a, an important consideration. So let me at least uh, proceed with just one particular mention of the significance of this day in the Jewish calendar, uh, which is probably fortuitous because um, we'll see that there's a kind of mystical conjunction um, between things. And so let me just mention something. And then at the beginning of the second half of the class, I will give a little bit more of a mystical or Hasidic teaching that relates to this once you've begun to absorb a little bit of um, what's involved. So today um, in, the, uh, in the Jewish calendar is the 33rd day um, uh, of the counting uh, between the holiday of Passover. It begins the day after, the first day after Passover until the festival of Shavuot or um, uh, 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 Pentecost, as it's called in the Christian calendar, but it's a Shavuot with the giving of the law. So it's between the exodus of Egypt and the receiving uh, of, uh, of the law at Sinai. Um, and that is a spiritual progression uh, of inner um, ethical and spiritual transformation um, from the condition of, of enslavement in mind and in body to a sense of spiritual freedom and ethical consciousness. Um, according to tradition, and this is why we're going to be making this turn, uh, this day is of particular significance because uh, according to one tradition in the Talmud, uh, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiba um, died uh, by plague because of their hatred uh, and mean-spiritedness towards one another. There was a kind of mean-spiritedness uh, of what it means to be a student and a fellow um, a, a traveler. Uh, and because of this, um, according to the tradition, uh, there was this plague. Uh, and part of that plague was the, the ruin of the inner beauty of the, of the inner person. Right? The inner person's um, hold or special quality um, was, was ruptured. So it became, uh, it turns out then, according to the Kabbalistic tradition, that on this particular day, there is a repair of what you, you've heard of the word tikkun olam, but the tikkun is a repair of the quality of inner beauty. That means the quality of love between one person and another. And when that repair was being done, the plague which became a, 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 a physical expression of moral corruption uh, ended. So it's very much uh, part of this kind of strange time we're in, um, but the, uh, according to the tradition, it was due to mean-spiritedness, uh, to baseless hatred. Um, and so on the process going from Egypt to Sinai is a process of the uh, purification of one's inner ethical and spiritual qualities. So we will um, uh, see that this ki these kinds of um, Kabbalistic teachings, um, which uh, have sort of returned again in this neo-Hasidic or the, the turn towards um, contemporary mysticism within America, uh, will be something we'll be talking about with, with Arthur Green. Uh, and at the big, after we have the break, I will give you a, a teaching of one of the, of the so-called Alexander Rebbe from from Poland about this inner repair uh, 
that's uh, involved. So the, um, uh, that's just by way of um, setting up the notion that the notion of uh, what we'll come to see, this uni uh, unitive or panentheistic consciousness that Green will be talking about, um, uh, is, is not separable from ethical and spiritual transformation um, and uh, change. Um, so it's not simply a matter of mystical experience, it's also a matter um, uh, of inner repair and worldly repair at the same time. Um, the ethics and the mysticism uh, go uh, together. So I'll come back, I'll come back to that. I want to actually begin slightly uh, differently than I began in the, uh, in the other ways, precisely because um, we're turning to the, the unique situation of the kind of rebirth of American Jewish theology in the 60s, 70s, in, in this particular era. That means that the people are reflective of a certain moment in American culture and Jewish culture. They're not people who were born in Europe from whom the tradition, uh, for example, with uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik or Heschel, um, is with their mother's milk. That is to say, they both grew up in an intensely traditional environment in which the totality of the tradition was around them. It was part of the air and the smell and the feel. There was no outside. Everything was on the inside. And it was only until these individuals, for personal reasons, go um, to Berlin, um, that they begin to encounter Western philosophy and all the conditions that in fact helped shape and reform their response to the world. Um, for those who were born during the war, um, like Green and myself, who for who carry the tradition of the Holocaust and the post-Holocaust period um, into our uh, adolescence, but we're not um, born in Europe. Um, that is one part of the background. The other part of the background is the America of the 60s, right? America of the 60s is a period of time of enormous openness. It's a period of time um, uh, in which the notion of the postmodern wasn't a term yet, but there was this openness of choice. One would have to choose to become Jewish or observant. One would begin to choose the form of theological expression. It wasn't simply something that one acquired through some kind of mimetic or imitative practice from their parents. You weren't simply continuing a mimesis from the home, although uh, many of the people did grow up in traditional homes, but you couldn't escape the openness uh, of this uh, new world uh, of the 60s, a world in which people were going to the university for the first time. Um, the, many of the people were first generation uh, in the university. Um, they were beginning to try to integrate what they were learning in the university with whatever smattering of traditional knowledge they had, which wasn't always necessarily something coherent and cohesive. So they had to become this notion of choice and developing a spiritual language of some form of authenticity. It was a period of time in which there was enormous openness to other religions. We're talking about the openness um, towards, um, towards Eastern religions. Um, this was a, a period of time in which the currents of becoming aware uh, of Taoism and Zen uh, and Tibetan Buddhism was very much in the air uh, in, say in the area of Massachusetts, in, in Cambridge, um, in the areas where Green and I um, uh, would, would have picked this up. It was a period in time of enormous 
um, experimentation, experimentation in terms of community. What was the community that one wanted to live in? Was it a religious community, a politically active community? Uh, was it going to be um, a, an Eastern community? What, how is one going to choose their spiritual path particularly when the options of Judaism were not always clearly competitive with some of the strong spiritual appeal that was coming from the East. There was also a much wider sense of consciousness, right? This consciousness um, that was also affected by um, the psychedelic world the age of Aquarius, right? That there was a much larger, there was a, a dimension of consciousness that was different and beyond rational consciousness, right? That doesn't mean that this is now a, um, a critique necessarily of Kant. It was simply the awareness that the forms of reason and the form, the limited forms um, uh, of, uh, of rational, uh, American religion were not sufficient for the spiritual urges that were being felt by a vast range, let us say, of Jewish people growing up at that particular time. And there was an enormous appeal towards other forms of spirituality, other forms of consciousness, and other forms of experience. Um, fellowship. Um, it was a time of, of breaking out of certain kinds of other limitations, uh, the feminist revolution, the sexual revolution. All of these were converging uh, in the 60s together with the notion um, of the, uh, after the Six Day War, a new sense of pride uh, of being Jewish uh, and an American Jewish religiosity in America, not simply a transplant from Europe, but something that would reflect uh, an authentic spirituality. So a lot of this is part of the background that we will be coming to when we turn to green. And a lot of that will help explain the confessional and I voice. We'll go through some pages and see it's his use of the word I yeah, is everywhere because the issue of what was understood in those days is authenticity, um, self, self realization. The touchstone is the self, not just the authenticity to the tradition. They had to become a certain kind of spiritual balance. So I'm going to come back to these kinds of issues. But let me now widen uh, the lens in a slightly different way by uh, raising this to a certain level uh, of conceptual uh, issues and that we're facing um, the American Jewish religious scene in the 60s and 70s as this is beginning to, to emerge, but is a unique question of what it means to become religious in America for a Jew and perhaps for Christians who don't necessarily grow up uh, in a very, uh, in, a, um, uh, in a religious home or religious uh, environment. So the, um, the, the pressing question um, is, where do you begin your religious life? Where do you place your feet? Where do you start? What is the initial authenticating question? Are you an individual with personal feelings first? Are you a person who has universal regard for the world? Are you connected with a particular tradition? Where do you put your feet down and say, this is where I begin? What experiences become the first level of normative or authentic experience? So that you begin to say, this is where I begin. As we'll see with a person like Green or others, one doesn't just choose to become a panentheist. You don't choose to become a panentheist. It chooses you. One's religious starting point chooses you. There are certain experiences that a people are going through 
that become the most authentic expression of what it means to be a person or a religious person. And those, in many cases, precede their rational justification. And they come up through the environment, they come up through what everybody is reading. And so people are asking, what are the vectors of an authentic life? What is the vector of a life that is authentic to myself as an individual in the larger world? And does it make any sense for me to add the language of a religious tradition? Am I going to become a syncretist and just absorb everything that's coming my way? Or am I going to make a specific choice that one religious path is the only religious path? Can you ignore? the multiple paths? Can you ignore the multiple languages? And if you can't, what do you do? Do you retreat into a new form of parochialism? Or do you try to create a different form of spiritual openness that can remain at the same time committed to the language of a specific tradition? That you can only speak one language at a time, but nevertheless, you're aware that truth is not simply isolated in one particular spiritual neighborhood or one particular spiritual environment. That's part of the challenge of America, but it was particularly a challenge in the 60s and 70s in ways that you, many of you can only read about. But this was the larger atmosphere um, of, of open possibility. So you had to choose um, what, were the, what, was, what was the book that was gonna change you? Was it going to be um, Herman Hesse's, uh, one of uh, Hesse's book of Narcissus and Goldman, uh, or was Siddhartha gonna change you, or is it gonna be a religious text? And people were opened up to things, not necessarily from a scriptural point of view, but were opened up through all kinds of novels. We talked about Hesse, so Magus de Ludi was a very powerful book along with Siddhartha. These were books that um, uh, uh, Dostoevsky, these are things that were changing people's uh, notion, the people on being uh, on a journey. Um, the books that were around at that time, like Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Right? On the Road is a metaphor for being in a process of spiritual and personal development, of change. This was part of this, um, this atmosphere. So the question would be, where do you put your foot down? Where do you say, this is my I, and I will now integrate things this way? Or this is the community that I'm choosing with full knowledge that there are other options. And I should add um, another component. And this was, um, I mentioned before, uh, people like Peter Berger, sociologist of knowledge. Um, well, Berger wrote a very interesting book with his brother-in-law um, called Invisible Religion. Uh, and I mention it in this particular context because they were indicating that not just, he was writing also about Christians uh, in Europe, um, but also because his brother-in-law was a Lutheran pastor uh, in Europe, but also about the American scene, that many people, and this may resonate not necessarily with you, but with your parents or whatever, many people were growing up and had a very minimal religious education. Or the religious education was still at the level of childhood explanations of things. And people stopped that education, perhaps, when they were in the seventh or eighth grade or when they went to high school. But the people who were speaking for the religion were speaking platitudes. They weren't speaking authentic religious statements that really grabbed the person in their gut, that this is something real. They were just platitudes, right? Um, peace of mind this and that, all kinds of things of the books that were floating around um, uh, at, that, at that time. And then people went to, after high school, went to college, and their level of sophistication 
in the encounter with, the, with Western literature and philosophy and other religions was far in excess and much more sophisticated than what they had received in their childhood Jewish or Christian education. And so there's no reason to remain Christian or Jewish. There was no reason. It was silly platitudes. It didn't make sense. And don't forget, you have to understand, these were places where people were, in, in America at that time, even within the more traditional communities, there were, it was still, um, uh, it, it had not yet turned the corner towards something integrated and more sophisticated, uh, even in terms of orthodox education. So there's a lot of falling away. There's a lot of thinning out. And so when people are getting to the point of making choices, the outside realm of spiritual choices far exceeded in interest those things that were making a claim upon you or a person that they had only learned through the eighth grade by the time they were 13. Why would one want to commit one's life to an intellectual education that of 13 when you were aware of all kinds of other more interesting ways of articulating ethics and spirituality and religion from other religions, other persons, and so on. In other words, there was a, a lack of models. So people were beginning to do this on their own. The changes were done by individuals on their own, people like Green, uh, others, and then he and us together formed certain kind of religious communities to begin to create a, uh, a place of worship and celebration and study that would exceed the idiosyncratic choices that individuals were making. Let me just re-emphasize that. Part of the issue then of each individual, the individualism of the 60s and 70s, which is part of this, meant that people were making idiosyncratic decisions. Many of you may even be doing that now as you're growing up. That's part of this kind of, um, uh, what Erickson would talk about, this time of moratorium. You have a place within college where you can try out multiple choices. As Erickson uh, spoke of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, the moratorium. So you have a chance that you're not really have to be committed to be a responsible person in the world. You can think through a variety of choices, right? Um, but these choices for many people who didn't have deep religious roots or the roots just didn't, couldn't sink in in a more interesting American environment, we're making idiosyncratic or syncratic choices. So part of the movement towards communitarianism or com communities of the early Jewish types of study groups, of prayer groups, were to begin to make a virtue of necessity that people who were making idiosyncratic choices could join with other people who were thinking and feeling the same way who could pray the same way or with the same hesitations, who could act through public um, ethical actions of um, storefronts, uh, helping the poor, all of this which was extremely uh, powerful um, at that particular time. So this issue, um, I, wanna, I wanna just mention a couple of just key, key terms that emerge from this. Um, that I resonate to. Green doesn't use them in the same way. But as we make the transition to Green and this book of radical um, Judaism, by the way, the book itself is a, um, uh, connects with both of those dimensions that I was talking about. Radical in the sense that you're putting your roots. The radix in Latin means the roots. There was a whole Christian movement of radical theology particularly in the Thomist and the Catholic world, where people were trying to go back to the traditions and sink their roots into that language, but that the flower of that, of those roots, would be a new form of religiosity. So radical in the one sense, 
is that it's sinking its roots, the radix, into the earth of a tradition, rather than just floating in the air. But radical in the other sense is that it's creating forms that were quite different from the traditional Jewish or Christian forms that were in the environment. They were radical in the sense they're pushing a boundary, pushing a form of expression that had not yet come. So they were, they were seen as radical in terms of anybody who would say, that's the, that's, it's the fringe of me is radical, right? If you're inside it, if you're not radical, but the fringe of me is always radical, okay? But acknowledging that is to say that it's radical. So it's radical in that double sense. So let me just at least throw out um, several terms, one of which Green uses, but I just want, um, they're part of this world that's of the 60s and 70s in which all of this is beginning to come to expression. Um, so one form um, is the notion of self-realization. Self-realization with the emphasis on both halves of the hyphen and both together. Self, not necessarily communal realization, but self-realization. The self and one's self experience is a touchstone. Realization means allowing that to come to a certain type of reality, a type of what later became the language of authenticity. That's the language of the 60s, authenticity. But self-realization is that the self and the self's experience is a major touchstone towards what is normative and what can be accepted. And it's a realization of the self, but not the self as an isolated entity, but the realization of the self in a much larger, let us say, religious or ethical or intercultural um, environment. Okay, so self-realization. A second key term that I would want to bring in here, let's say it's a term that uh, many of you might know from Paul Ricoeur, but I want to uh, apply it in this case. It's the notion of appropriation. Appropriation. So that's this notion that there's something that precedes you, a tradition that you may not know or you only know in part, but you want to appropriate it. You want to make it your own. You want to make it real. You want to make it spiritually authentic. Not another person's religious truth, but my religious truth. How do I appropriate that in an authentic way? So that brings in um, another key term that Certainly, that if, if he doesn't use it exactly, I'll try to explain it. And that's this issue that, that some of you already may know from Walter Benjamin, the notion of translation. Part of the issue of appropriation is how do you translate the tradition that you're appropriating into a language that's meaningful? What is that inner hermeneutic? What is that inner private way that you're trying to make this real and authentic? Because it will only become that way through appropriation, through translation. Therefore, one of the things that Green will be doing, or anybody who is involved in this larger issue, is to try to create a new religious language that would be authentic to the wider religious or intellectual environment, but also draw on Jewish sources. So we'll see that he's going to be doing that at various stages, and that you can see what his project is as he's trying to recover a lost tradition, let us say the Kabbalistic or mystical tradition, or a dimension of that, and try to now appropriate its language, but not just its language, its theological valence, to his or our or his group's authentic experience, okay? And the, and the fourth 
um, is a term that he uses um, in relationship to his larger evolutionary model, and it's often used in a whole lot of other uh, creationist narratives or th theology, things like that, is this notion of emergence, emergence. So he's going to be talking about emergent biological or cultural realities, emergent mental realities, emergent changes of consciousness. Emergence injects the notion of historical difference and change. Where do you locate yourself on this huge spectrum of the emergence and the transformation of the history of Christianity, the history of Judaism, the history of Islam? Where do you say, this is the point in the spectrum that I stand? This is the language of understanding that I'm appropriating. And why? What is it doing for you? Was it simply something that you got at home? Is that sufficient so that you're simply a caretaker or are you more than a caretaker? Okay, so part of this is being a caretaker is not sufficient. So it's balancing the loyalty to the past with loyalty to self, which is not an easy balancing proposition. And people at a more conservative level of the spectrum will handle that tension one way. And people on the more liberal reform aspect or more on a fringe side of new age uh, religiosity will handle that tension quite differently. But the modality will be which is making the dominant claim, the tradition of the self, and how am I going to negotiate uh, between that? So to sharpen that issue, and it's really to help you begin to get into this mentality, it's the, ten the tension between integrity um, and, um, and loyalty. It's a convergence, right? Integrity to the self and the self's honesty and commitment and responsibility towards a tradition that has given you these possibilities, right? And that negotiation is not going to be done in European Polish terms. It's not going to be done in pre-war terms. It's going to be done in the strange new land of America, right? So the language of authenticity and the language of integrity was a big buzz term at that time. Lionel Trilling during these days was teaching at Columbia. And these were the terms that were being done when he's giving his famous lectures on integrity and Freud, right? All this is new to this new generation of person who's now coming to consciousness. For you, this stuff is old hat. But for us, this wasn't old hat, it was all new. It was simply coming in and then one was constantly trying to negotiate an intellectual and spiritual integrity that would work. Um, so I want to um, just reiterate as just coming towards green now is this notion um, that one doesn't simply choose one's path, part of that issue is that one is being chosen by any number of preconditioning factors, right? Including one's proclivity, one's uh, natural proclivity. So let me just slightly hint at this, and I'm, I'm not reducing any of the thinkers that we've studied before to some um, um, social biology or family system. But if you look at one book of Rabbi Soloveitchik, the uh, halachic man that we didn't read, one of the core moments that he describes at the beginning is being a child in the home of 
rabbis who were discussing Talmud and Maimonides, and he's overhearing the discussions. He's overhearing the discussions and the decisions of how to live out those discussions. I don't think that one can easily separate that primal moment of parental and family experience from Soloveitchik's larger philosophical notion that you begin with objective cultural forms. That was, that was primary. It was absolutely primary, right? Now it doesn't, you can't reduce that, but that is a first mother's milk experience. That the tradition is there, the discussion is there, the objective forms precede experience. And you experience within that objective form. However journey you go, that can't be factored out. Okay? Or now to take Heschel. So Heschel grows up in a total Hasidic environment, an environment of spiritual, religious feeling and consciousness. The feelings come before the forms. They have to be fed into the forms. The forms are there, but they're fed by religious experience, okay? And so when Heschel goes to Warsaw, and he publishes his first book of modernist Yiddish poetry, which was called the Shem HaMaforish Mensch, the human being who is the, the God-man, as it were, right? The person who, who expresses the divine image. So the opening page on the left-hand side, he dedicates it to his father. On the right-hand side is a Yiddish inscription that says, Chabwunder um, Gebeten, I prayed for wonder. I prayed for wonder more than happiness. That's the end of the phrase. I prayed for wonder more than happiness. That is a core issue of that type of consciousness, of where you start, right? Because he had the wonder and he's praying for wonder as that issue of authenticity, right? Chavunder Gebeten, I prayed for wonder. On Glick, instead of, instead of just happiness, okay? And when we, um, we, we, we turn to uh, Green, he is going to give you a lot of his personal inner conflicts of growing up in New Jersey uh, with a father who was a Marxist and was not a believer, et cetera, et cetera, and part of his inner rebellion. But he's going to find a language and a moment that is transformative through persons and books. And that the notion of what will be called panentheism, so let me just define that. Panentheism is not pantheism in which everything is God. And it's not theism, which he will say, when he talks about theism, remember he's talking about the vertical, where God is above and outside the world. But panentheism is a religious notion that began to be called as such in the 19th century that says, God is the totality of the place of the world, but the world is not God's place. That is to say, God fills the entirety of what we would call world being, but God is above and beyond. So there's a, a radical total, the, the, it's a mysticism of radical immanentism of God being radically imminent, but panentheism says there is an unknowable dimension of God that exceeds that, beyond knowing, understanding, speaking. 
So that retains a kind of transcendent dimension, which is beyond, right? That is part of that tension, right? A radical immanentism, which is the panentheism, but that is, that's God's imminent presence. And then there is this much larger notion. Um, and many of the Hasidic um, uh, theologies um, are working within that particular framework. Now, um, Green refers to the fact that one of the books that made this radical change for him was a book or a series of essays uh, by, by Hillel Zeitlin, a very um, uh, interesting person, let us say, um, uh, who grew up in a Chabad environment and then ended up writing books about Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and Spinoza, and later came back to a new form of Hasidic spirituality and died as a martyr on his way on the death march to Treblinka, wearing his prayer shawl and phylacteries and holding a book of the Zohar. Now, and the book is called Ben Shnei Olamot, Between Two Worlds. So Zeitlin represents, as, a, as one of the first people of neo-Hasidism, the turn of the century, precisely what people like Green or others like myself felt at that between two worlds, the total Western world and the world of tradition. How do you live within that, not necessarily making a choice, but live as as that issues up, it's a, it's a permeable negotiation. It's a permeable negotiation. It's a totally different issue. It's not just in, the, in between them. It's between, but across and integrating. So Green refers in the book to an essay that Seitlin had written um, on being and nothingness. That, that gave him the new language, that he could then integrate Western intellectualism, history of religion, biblical criticism, Hasidic spirituality. It became a new language. Which, and I wanna just read to you, just slightly from the beginning of that essay so that you can feel what that was as a primary moment that can take a person and turn them around, right? Because we're saying you have to start somewhere. And he's saying he starts with the new possibility of synthesis comes as a disclosure that precedes in a certain sense, this rational decision, I'm gonna become a panentheist. You don't make a decision to become a panentheist. You can't make a decision to become a monist, right? So this, just listen to the beginning of being in nothingness. Um, this is a long introduction to Green, but I, it's, I think, the only way I think you can really begin to move forward and understand it. So this is the way he begins uh, this essay. The blessed creator's life energy is everywhere. Everything, this is written at the turn of the century, last century. Everything that exists surely has some taste smell, appearance, attractiveness, or some other qualities. But when we strip away the physical aspect of the thing and consider it only spiritually, considering, for example, the taste or smell without the physical object itself, we will understand that we are dealing with something that cannot be held in our hands or seen with our eyes of flesh. It is in fact grasped only by our life force our human soul. It therefore must indeed be something spiritual, the life force of our blessed creator, dwelling within the corporeal thing like the soul within the body. And then a paragraph later, the nothing, the divine nothing, is the spiritual essence 
of that which is conceived and the spiritual essence of the soul that conceives it. So that is a moment of realization that can change a person's life, as it does for Green. It opens up a certain notion. And then I just want to, just as, an, as a final transition, just so you see this part of this language, I'm reading from a, a prayer that's recited in traditional or Hasidic homes on the Sabbath Eve. It's a famous prayer uh, by the, uh, the Karlina Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Karlinka, it's called Kayesov. Uh, I, I, I yearn for you, O God. In the translation of Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, who introduced Green to Zeitlin and was an embodiment of this issue. So in other words, you have to, you have to, people experience these things through persons and they experience them through the articulation. So this is, um, so this is, this is the way the, this prayer song begins that's recited on the Sabbath table. I won't read the whole thing. Oh Lord, my God, where are you? I call you as if from afar, and you, my Redeemer, dwell in my heart, so close, and I know it not. Here you are present in my inmost, and so too are you at the outermost edge, both source of mine and goal. Where my feelings rise in me, there are you stirring me, nesting in the womb of my urge. So it's a prayer, this Kayeso prayer echoes prayers and poems of Rabbi Yehuda Levi um, in the 11th century, which were drawing on Sufi mystical spirituality. You go out to God and God is already meeting you from the inside. There's no inside and outside. You simply have to realize there's no inside and outside. Being on the inside is having um, the outside of God totally part of your being. So the first issue that I want to stress is that when those kinds of issues are conveyed through texts or persons and embodied, those become the transformative moments. It's not a feel theoretical, theological structure that one then says, well, I'm going to take this piece of fruit from the tree and that piece of fruit from the tree, right? There's a primary moment, which is the moment of commitment and faith where something seems real. The theology comes after. Theology is always a testimony to these primary experiences that then try to articulate them and corroborate them in relationship to a tradition. But the religious experience is primary, whether a person will say that or not, or the life religious experience is primary. And theology is a witness to how you live that primary understanding that was transformative there's always going to be an inner conversion of the soul towards something. That becomes the notion of awakening to a religious truth, right? And that comes at a pre-conscious level where one is claimed, right? Heschel talked about it in a very different way. But I want you to understand that even for a modern person in America, the issue is not fiddling through books and deciding I'm going to take this. It's like, it, theology is not like a, a Lego set, right? That you kind of take a Bible and you make Legos all around it and you cover it with a Lego thing, hoping that it all clicks together, right? Right? And it's not like reading things and taking stickies and putting them all over you. So now I become this person covered with these kinds of spiritual stickies, 
it starts with a primary moment. And then one can begin the reappropriation of authenticity within the tradition, right? Otherwise, you're always on the outside. You don't know when that moment is coming or how it's coming. But theology is always a testimony to that. And then reading a primary text like scripture or other texts that will reconfirm that in a new language. Let's say reading scripture through the lens of Hasidic language or philosophical language, right? It reconfirms that, right? So in that sense, it's a kind of hermeneutical circle, but you have to enter that circle on the basis of experience, not on the basis of a, a, an intellectual juggling with um, syllogisms, okay? So now I want to begin, in a certain sense, to turn to Green. But before I do, I just want to find out if, if people want to raise anything at this point. Uh, I was I'm trying to bring you into a kind of sociology of American theological spirituality uh, in kind of little dribs and drabs, but that you can begin to feel um, that, um, that the theological task now is it's a very different it's an american spiritual task and it takes place within an american language and it takes place with the notion of world religions that make sense right there's no notion of a certain in this case of a certain parochialism there's not a fear or to say green would not say what soloveitchik would say i can't convey my experience in another language, right? There's an attempt to try to find deeper common core between religious systems and languages so that they are mutually fructifying. It's not that I have a private language and you have a private language and we create a third private language, but we both want to grow as religious people. So we want to find the way to create that convergence. That's a whole other way of talking about interreligious connection, right? That there is a deeper spiritual bond that people want to struggle with together. Okay, so now I saw Daniel has his hand up, uh, Ranana has her. So let's start with those two, maybe we'll cut a couple and then we'll move forward. Yeah, Daniel. Um, so I just wanted, to, I mean, you may have just answered this, but just with what you were saying um, at the end about the notion of a primary moment that allows you to sort of go back, would you, would you make the same claim about um, Soloveitchik and Heschel? Um, Namely what? That, that, they, that they sort of, that theology for them as well would start with a primary moment, or, or is it because they grew up in the old world and, and there is no primary moment that everything is a primary moment. Well, I was, I was indicating that part of their primary moment was for Soloveitchik was that moment of being a child overhearing his, his father talk to other rabbis about how Maimonides solves emotional and halachic problems, right? That is a primary experience. It is filled out with many other things in a traditional environment and has so too, right? That, that, but don't forget, they're also going to go through many, many transformations, too, because they went through the West. But I'm trying to indicate that they're also uh, primordial moments that give a person a sense of being in the world, right? And that they may remain somewhat stable despite all of these kind of intellectual or spiritual transformations. So it's a little bit of both. Renana? Um, this might be kind of a follow up on that, but it seems to, I was wondering if Green and maybe some, some of the others who he's basing on would say that it's impossible to sort of um, get to theology or get to belief of some sort without some kind of primordial experience. Because it does seem to me like I, I know people who sort of intellectualize themselves into belief, that's not my experience. Uh, but would they actually say, no, there was some kind of experience there that started that and that that kind of journey is impossible? Or would they say religious experience is the beginning of my theological journey? And I think... Look, I think, I, look I think we're, we, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make absolute claims. Um, 
people, I'm just, I'm trying to just talk about the difference between starting from the outside or starting from the inside. If you're, um, if you let us say are born within a specific religious environment, part of theology becomes a kind of high scale apologetics of justification. Everything is explained back on what you consider to be a primary given of the tradition. And so all the, it's not a testimony, it's not a testimony to that experience, it's an attempt to apologize in very sophisticated language that, uh, of, of meaningfulness. I'm trying to say that there's also a type of moment, and it's particularly, uh, I think it's characteristic of all fundamentally religious persons, but particularly in America, which values choice and decision, that you start with a moment and you build out the theological world of clarification, which is the testimony from within. Obviously, these are complex dialectical things, but many people who grow up in a traditional environment. It's it, the, 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 the theology is a justification of where you already are. Right? It's a very sophisticated form of apologetics, right? That doesn't want to call itself apologetics. So it's a form of justification, clarification, right? But then there's another way that one starts with a radical moment in experience that then has to grow up into the tradition so that it works as a growing language. That's part of, I think, what Green or some moderns might say. And I think that that's, I think that is a, a um, that is included um, uh, in um, in all great religious thinkers, um, and it's certainly a feature that affects religious reformers who are within a tradition, and then they have a new aha moment in which everything coheres in a new theological constellation that's felt as an experience. And the theology then becomes something that's worked out as a testimony to that. And people will be attracted to that person because they're giving a new expression of religious experience and a new way of talking about the tradition that comes out of a new hermeneutic that has grown out of an experience. Okay? So it makes, it makes the issue of religious education complicated because it's always from the outside going forward. Um, but uh, let's leave that slightly aside. Um, uh, obviously, true religious education wants to go both ways, um, help people um, uh, encounter the, the mysterious as well. Anybody else have anything before we slightly move forward? I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page about this. So let's, let's begin uh, the exploration uh, uh, of green. And again, just to confirm how he is going to be talking. Um, so uh, on, page, on page one, uh, you can just, um, you can see how he begins. And we're gonna see this over and over again. I have been reading. I still think of myself primarily as a thinker. I, 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 it's gonna, I, there's gonna be a hundred eyes on every page. Because he's simply giving a witness to where he's starting from. He's not, he, he's not beginning, notice what, he's not going to, it's very interesting, because he's not going to begin by telling you what the postmodern situation is. He's not gonna give you a critique of the postmodern world. He's just going to begin by giving testimony of his spiritual stance. You don't like it? Chose the book. I don't apologize for anything. You want to you wanna overhear this? Join the conversation. But I'm not going to tell you how I solved every single problem. I'm going to start with where I'm starting from. And then I'm going to show you how I can think through a sophisticated modern Jewish religious life from that starting point. You don't like it, it's threatening, it's stupid, it's cheap, close the book. I don't care. Okay? So I'm a seeker. That is, the author of this book is a Jewish seeker. Okay? That's the 
only non-personal statement he makes. Then everything is an I. Just so you know where you're going, right? So it's a it's it's a theological quest. Um, my personal honesty is essential to my life as a seeker. Okay, personal and intellectual honesty, right? So I'm not I'm, I don't. I'm not going to lie. Who am I going to lie to? I have to stand before God. Who am I going to lie to? What traditional clothes am I going to put on to make myself appear this way and that way? Okay? So you can see where this starting point is. I try not to permit them to be overwhelmed by traditional claims, right? Or by emotional need. I am a longtime disciple of Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Shishka, who taught, do not deceive anybody, even yourself. Okay? That's the radical tradition of Kotsk. It's the radical tradition of no lies. Truth unto its innermost parts. And that begins with the questions you ask of yourself and what you're doing. Okay? Um, then he goes on to describe part of his a self a biology, but everything here um, is a traditional voice. And you jump to the top of page four, and he gives you his primary category, a category that he would have learned through the university and reading Rudolf Otto, the sacred. Right? Now the sacred is only a name for the primary experience. It's only that description of it. But if you say the sacred is the thing, but look what he says. He immediately takes the word sacred as a primary category. And then he does what I've been saying that the religious secret does. He immediately describes that in experiential terms. As I'm trying to help you see this in line three, the sacred. It's in quote. It's in scare. It's in quotes. Scare quotes because it's just a term. It's just a descriptive term. You don't live your life through descriptive terms. But now I can tell you this term because he says it refers to inward, mystical sense of awesome presence, a reality deeper than the kind we ordinarily experience. A moment that can come without warning. Okay. Now you could take any number of traditional Jews or Christians and it would give you a totally different notion, different explanation of the sacred. Right? You could start with the sense that the sacred is the radical other difference from the profane. You could have any number of ways of describing the sacred. But then you can have a description of the sacred that starts with something you knew before you had the term. Right? You don't go from the term to the experience. The term is an attestation of an experience. So he's describing religion, but not anybody's religion, not anybody's sense of the sacred. That's why it's important to understand what do you do with religious language? What do you do with the terminology that you're adopting so that they are absolutely real? Right? And then he goes on to say, when those kinds of things happen, ordinariness slips away. So there's an attempt to come in contact with the real. And you don't know how to put it into language. That's what he's trying to tell you is this spiritual starting point that he has. And then he now refers to his teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the astonishment of such moments, that which my most revered teacher term radical amazement is the starting point of my religious life. But for him, it's not the starting point in which, well, he does hint at this, but it's not that you sense immediately that there is a claim upon you. There's something searching to ask you what you're doing with your life. He will two or three times in the book do that, and that's also because 
he's a Jewish thinker and he's a rabbi and he understands all of this, right? But Heschel is very concerned to move much more quickly from that statement of the radical amazement that it embeds within it phenomenologically the call of God, where are you? And we'll see when, he, when Green talks about where are you, that's the searching of God, he'll answer it in three different ways, right? So this is, um, this is something um, that's, uh, that's, that's primary. Um, uh, or um, then, he, then he confesses to the fact by referring to Zeitlin on page six, that this person gave me a language that I didn't have before to negotiate between these worlds, right? And to find what he calls a particular religious language, right? So look at them, there's, there's the second paragraph, Th these confessional statements. I am not only a Jewish theologian working within a religious language and historical context, familiar to no more than the tiniest fraction of humanity, but he draws on the language and symbolism uh, of the larger Jewish mystical tradition. So he says, I am a neo-Hasidic Jew. That is to say, he's not Hasidic in the sense that he lives within the parochial confines of a Hasidic world or accepts their theological worldview, but that their religious experiences refracted through their teachings can become resonant with his theological quest as a modern person, right? It becomes resonant and gives a language for oneness, for the mystery of the seen and the unseen, the mystery uh, of the sacred, and for the mystery um, uh, that one is questing to live out at every single uh, moment. But then he makes a second move in addition. I'm not just a neo-Hasidic person, that is to say, I have found my language that expresses my inner sensibility in Hasidic material that gives me a language that keeps me, that keeps my universal primary experience in the Jewish game. But he says, I'm more than that. He says on the top of seven, I'm a religious humanist, right? So he, he, says, so, and he says this unabashedly. Humanism means understanding our fate along with that of the entire planet depends on human action. So then there's a question of how do you fit the responsibility for human action and work for the sake of the planet, that is to say all sentient and non-sentient beings on the planet. How do you work for that as the larger goal of being a human being in the framework of being a religious person, which is shaped by one's religious consciousness and language, right? So the larger, Notice it's, it, it, it's important to get this if, if I'm able to capture it correctly. But the starting point is the way that you frame your religious consciousness from within a specific tradition. But the telos, the end point, is something that would bring him together with all people concerned with the same telos, namely, not what are you doing with your own religious life, but what are you doing to save the planet? What are you doing to save the earth? Which means all the people on the earth or the people in your proximity, right? So that's the arc that we're talking about. You start with a primary moment but it's not simply a self-indulgent moment. That religious moment of totality has in fact, for this kind of religious sensibility, opened up the most maximal sphere of divine presence, the entire world. But I'm not going to simply be 
a Jew in that who prays three times a day, my actions have to also have the consciousness that I'm within a world of people of multiple religions, multiple needs of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the larger spiritual ethical telos at the other end of the spectrum. So that becomes, um, I'm enlarging on what uh, from Green, but using him paradigmatically, that becomes a particular way of this very different form of theology than was expressed in the first two books, right? That the religious experience now is giving you a universal aspect of God's imminent presence. And it's precisely that imminent totality of oneness, which one lives out with all people who share humanity or who are working for the sake of human life, right? That it's our planet, not just my life in Brooklyn or Teaneck, right? right? So that, that larger issue, so the two go together as religious claim and ethical claim. They're not separable, right? And they have two intersecting um, vectors. What would happen if the two vectors um, compete and you have to make a choice? Um, I know how Green would choose, but let's, we'll have to let him make, make that decision, right? So, um, When he moves um, onto page 19, I want to just jump ahead a little bit. Let's just get the, um, so, um, or let's, let's just jump back to 16. I begin with a theological assertion. As a religious person, I believe that the evolution of species is the greatest sacred drama of all time. It is a tale in which the divine waits to be discovered. That's part of this issue of emergence. The hidden God waits to be discovered through, through religious consciousness. That is to say, we can live within the framework of small parochial gods of particular traditions, or we can begin to wait for this evolution or emergence of religious consciousness from his point of view in which people of all religions will become part of the same consciousness and project even though they're speaking slightly different languages or very radically different languages. So now notice, it's a, I just wanna make a point here about the structure of the book from this point of view, which you may not have noticed. When he's beginning here with this discussion of evolution and moving from whatever the origins would be symbolically expressed in scripture, but more fundamentally articulated to the symbolism of religion, uh, of scientific language or an alternate symbolic language. When he says that evolution is the sacred drama of all time, he's, make, he's making a very interesting statement. He's saying that he's now articulating a theology of creation. He's not saying a theology of the creation that begins in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's giving you a theology of creation that begins and that, that is not conflicted with the, with the evolution of the species, with the scientific evidence. That's God given from the get go and emerges. Right? The particular articulation from his point of view of this in Genesis 1 is one moment in religious consciousness and history. Whether it's divinely revealed and inspired to the person or not, but it's one moment of articulating the beginning. 
but from his point of view it's a it's 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 not it's it doesn't open up the full end game the end game is where is this larger project of the evolution of mind the emergence of the species the sense of the totality going so it's a theology that begins with a theology it's a creation theology but it's a creation theology that also begins with the theological awareness. It begins with that theological awakening that God is the source of all becoming because God is the, so is the imminent source of all. And within that all, there is emergent becoming, right? Which doesn't limit God, it's just a way of expressing that emergent becoming to become aware of the divine as the all. So there's a convergence between a theology of creation and the same mystical insight that begins at the beginning. Now, Green may not articulate it just this way, but that's fine. I'm trying to speak about it uh, in a meta language, but I think uh, I'm, 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 I, I have a sense of where he's going with that. But I, I'm just trying to help you see this much larger issue. Precisely, and we're going to come back to this, precisely because you begin with the theology of creation, which begins also with the theological intuition that God is the all. Right? You can never be, how you could never confirm it. How would you confirm it? It's a starting point of theological belief. But how would you confirm it? By adding up the microbes in the universe? And what if they say, I'm not God? So you can't, you can't get, you, you have to get there through some theological moment of transformation. But then you use a theology of creation that is founded on that moment that will give a language of emergence of this totality. Now, why does he want to have this sense of emergence from the evolutionary point of view? Because within the biological evolution, there's also the transformation of mind, which means the transformation of religious mind that thinks differently about the world. And we'll see that, do you think about the world in terms of the horizontal, in his language, or the vertical? That God is above, as if God, there's a space above and then there's no God below, right? These kind of weird um, ways of talking about the geography of God because we're upright creatures, right? If you crawled on the ground and you're a child, you probably think that God is on the earth, right? And below is, is higher than above. But it's thinking through your body that you think that God is just above. Or is the notion that the inside and the outside, right? So that's another... These, but these are only metaphorical constructs. But as he says, you would grow towards that, as the mind becomes aware of different possibilities. I'm not saying that theism is wrong. I'm saying from his point of view, he wants to get beyond theism because he thinks it's a limiting, it's a limiting position and that panentheism can include theism, which we'll talk about. But that's, but that's his choice. But he's, and it also brings him into harmony with the larger sense of the united world and mul multiple religions and Eastern religions that also talk about oneness, et cetera. But that will get to there. But if your starting point is this totality and emergence of changing levels of mind and apprehension of the world, it means that theology is also going to change. And the language about God will change through interpretation. And that's going to be part of the journey that he's going to take us on 
as we will move forward in the discussion. And that's why, although it begins with a the theology of creation, the next chapter is God, because he's going to talk about the conceptions of God have emerged and changed over time by the reinterpretations of scripture. Then Torah, which is revelation. And then Israel, what is the community that you live in? So he's taking over the deep structure of the book is a traditional Rosenzweigian or other structure, God, Torah, and Israel. Or it begins with creation and all of these theological aspects are aspects within a create, the first theology is a creationist theology. And within that, you can talk about God and Torah and Israel or community and action. But without a theology of creation, you can't get started. Where do you stand in this world? Uh, and where does God stand with you as creator? What does it mean by the creator? And the move, as I say, the purpose. Or the, so that's why he will say to someone, I don't believe in a certain notion of providence and will and things like that. Um, he's going to be talking about something that this is expressed through the evolution of the species, but that's God's will and that's the ultimate narrative. That's the sacred narrative. And it's within that that you can then begin to talk about notions of God, notions of Torah, which is the way God reveals something to consciousness, and redemption uh, or action uh, in the world. Um, I want to um, so on the eight, eight, just to do him justice in his own language on page eighteen. My theological position is that of mystical panentheist one who believes that God is present throughout all of existence. That being, or the divine name, the tetragram, underlies and unifies all that is. Right? That's his belief. Right? That's not something that you can come through rational deduction. Right? That's the starting point. Right? Then if you... Um, in the middle, he says, transcendence dwells within imminence, which is to say that within this imminence, things confront you, which are other than me. In other words, it's not a panentheism, which means you're in a soup without consciousness. Within this theological biosphere, things are confronting you. And they make claims. That too is part of the divine pulsing within the mystery of what you could, the, the evolution of, this, of things or the, or the happening of things. Or look, so he says, my mystical pan, in the next paragraph, my mystical panentheism, I mean the underlying oneness is accessible to human experience and reveals itself to humans as the deeper levels of the human mind become open to it. That is this issue of the emergence. Your theology is what your mind is open to being seen. If you're stuck in a theological dogmatism, you'll only see through, those, through, the, through that framework. It may be the true framework, but he's saying he's making a very particular claim. The radical otherness of God, so insisted upon by Western theology, is not an ontological otherness, but an otherness of perspective. To open one's eyes to God is to see being in a radically different way. So here is Green talking neo-Hasidism. This is the language of Chabad theology. This is the language of Hasidic theology. It's not just that he's making a claim that the radical otherness um, 
is, ontolo is not ontological, but it's a perspective, he is channeling a Hasidic understanding of that, that what you perceive of the world depends on the state of your spiritual consciousness, right? How much of the totality you see, how your perspective of that, right? The death of God is simply the death of a certain conception of God. It's not the death of God. It's when certain notions of God die as a reality. That's what Nietzsche was saying, right? He uses the language of a, of, of a post-Christian Christian because that's what he's fighting against. That's why that resonates in a certain way. But the death of God is the death of certain conceptions of God that no longer are real. And so now he's trying to talk about a con emergent conceptions of God that are God real. That's a language that Buber said, Gott wirklich, that are God real. Right? But the way he's talking here is this language of, um, uh, of Chabad or broader Hasidic, but he's not, gonna, he's not invoking that. If you know it, then you know the language game that he's playing. He believes it's an issue of perspective. That means all is one and difference, the way you see difference is a matter of your consciousness. Okay? There are lots of ways to see difference. And the way that the differences combine, right? Um, and he goes on, then he goes, just again, so you can see, um, let me just do one or two more pages and we'll take a break. On page 19, look in the middle, look how he talks. I, which I, uh, God, which I appear to be using, am I speaking? Let me answer. When I refer, I mean, I refer to the one as, et cetera, et cetera. And then towards the bottom, I seek to respond to the divine I am that I have been privileged to hear. I choose to personify, to call being by this ancient name God, in quotes, because it's only a it's only a theologumenon. It's only a terminus. It's a technical term. The word God means any number of things depending on what your theological position is. In doing so, I proclaim, I am proclaiming my love and devotion to being, my readiness to live a life seeking and responding to the truth. So that's why he says on uh, top of 20, that this is a, a, a creationist theology that, that, that's grounded in a pantheistic spiritual intuition is a reframe, right? It pushes the borders of Genesis 1.1 back into the primal mud. Not God into the primal mud, but a create notion of creation into the primal mud. And it, turns it forward into the most dignified emergence of a human being, let us say, right? And then on page 22, the most important thing for a religious person is not counter scientific explanations in the middle of the second par first paragraph, but to notice. So you notice he's not trying to give you an alternate scientific theory. He's just helping you to notice from a new mode of religious perspective. Let me just do one um, final thing if I can find it. Um, okay, so let's conclude this part of the discussion. He, so his modality of accessing Heschel's notion of God in search of man is the biblical question from Genesis in 28. Where are you? Right? That's the question that God confronts each person in their radical human nature. Okay? If you can hear it. 
So now he's going to say there are three ways to hear this, and I'm just going to go through this, and then we'll take a break. The first way is mental and intellectual. So he's recouping some of the arguments that he's been making. What does it mean, mental and intellectual? Are you going to live with a small mind or a large mind? How much are you going to take in? How wide are you going to cast your cognitive net? Are you going to always live with blinders? Or are you going to make your mind broader, even though you may want to put a framing on this to live within a specific tradition? Right? Do you live with tunnel vision? Or do you have some kind of peripheral vision? That doesn't mean you can't look straight ahead and have a specific language. But do you have peripheral vision or tunnel vision? That is the issue of the mind. How much are you going to take in, he's saying, because in the emergence of humanity, okay, the imperative to stretch the mind includes scientific thoughts. So he's talking, look, he's talking here. And that's going to include stretching your mind, or he's going to say that the evolution of theological notions is part of that. But we'll come back to this, right? So that's number one. Can you stretch your mind in the end to include Vedanta and Buddhism? That they're saying something true that you want to pay attention to. He's not saying you, you can't become a, a Vedantist. What are you going to, have, have you spent your whole life? But you can absorb it, okay? Um, so that's the stretching your mind to its fullest to know the one. If there's one, you mean God doesn't appear uh, in Tibetan Buddhism? That's just absolutely nonsense? That people are deluded? Now the second, what's the second? That, but that way of asking the question is a 60s and 70s question. Right? The second way of saying, where are you, the claim that God is making upon your consciousness is not the mind, but the heart. Not cognition, but emotion. To become more open, more aware, more empathic. To decide, what is, is the other like me? Or is the other different from me? What is the heart saying about that? As a relief. If God is one, hero is the Lord is one, what about that other person? Are they part of this oneness? Can you include that oneness in your religious consciousness? Where are you, the openness to vulnerability and dependence on forces beyond yourself? Right? Right? So it's a much greater empathic theological consciousness. It's all part of parsing the meaning of one. Where are you is because every claim comes to you as a person. It doesn't come to you as a universal statement, right? There's no categorical imperative or the categorical imperative may be, where are you? That's the imperative. But the answer is, I can't live like everybody else. I can't do anything in an abstract norm like anybody else. But I can respond to an overarching divine claim. So where are you? Where is that? That's the personal voice that speaks through this panentheistic, transpersonal God. Um, what is the spiritual work that each of us has to do? to allow that presence of otherness to enter consciousness and transform us, okay? That's part of what you say, what are you meditating on when you say the Lord, our God, the Lord is one? Are you saying one and not two, one and not three, one and not four, one and not 27, one and not prime number? What are you saying one? What is the theological force of saying God is one in the mind? or in the heart. So he's speaking like a religious teacher, 
he's not speaking to you either as a dogmatic theologian or ph philosophically, or that God is not a super mathematician. God is one, right? Where would that point of oneness ever be? So what are you saying if you claim that as a truth to which you want to bring yourself into accord? And then the third is the human deed. All people are in the image of God because they're expressions of God's reality. So how are you going to relate to every single thing within the one? That's a radical ethic. It doesn't say to you, um, what do you do at this moment? Or this is the commandment for this moment. Now, there will be a place for the divine commandments. But he's speaking in a much broader claim that's coming from Genesis, Genesis 1, right? Or Genesis uh, 3, right? In other words, he's using this as a way of speaking the universal claim of scripture that then will use that where are you that will come through Sinai in a more particular way for, from, for a point of view of Jewish theology. It's the same voice. It just gets refracted to a different way that the commandments become differentiated. It's the same voice of commandment and love. It's a, love, it's a commandment for the world. It's a commandment of care for the world. So it's both the commandment is law and love at the same time. Right. So maybe we should take a little bit of a break. Um, and what I want to come back to uh, after the break um, is to talk to you a little bit about what, this, what the implications of this are for the history of theological language about God. Why does he then construct this? And how does this fit in to his particular project. Okay? So let's, um, I have, I guess in your time, it's 10 after 11. Let's take 10 minutes and come back uh, at 20 after the hour. Okay? See you in a bit. So I think that, so if, if your people are behind their black uh, screens, uh, all, I'll come in for free. You can be, I can see your faces. Uh, uh, the, um, so I would say, um, I would, I'm, I'm hesitant because I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the, the primary intuition is that God is the whole. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is um, uh, everything is working for what we would consider to be the good as we understand it. Um, and it would include maybe the, um, a multiplicity of goods for different species that, 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 um, um, that are competing even for the same good earth, right? They can be different species, good of different species, and they're also competing for the same good earth. Right, or the same rain, or the same banana, right? Um, so, and that produces one type of ecology for the earth, another type of embedded series of ecologies for um, animal species, and a different kind of ethical ecology for the human species, right? But part of that would mean that if you are a religious person thinking theologically about the world, uh, what does it mean to try to think the whole? We can't think the whole from the outside as if you were a god, right? So the, so the theological person is caught in this trap, right? The intuition gives you the whole, but, but you can't think the whole you know, in that way. But what do you do with the with that as a thought that we can have as human beings. And what does that make a difference to you as you construct your religious and ethical life, right? That I don't 
my primary goal is not to think separation, but combination, All right? And that becomes an imperative from the diversity of the God-given world, okay? But I, I agree with you that it creates a whole variety of ethical issues in the, on the micro plane and the macro plane, because the only people who are gonna think about this is, um, is the human being, right? Um, and it's complicated, right? I mean, neuroscience and neurobiology has made it clear there's not only a, a, a genetic disposition to connect, there's a genetic, there's a hate gene that you hate the other of your species. So can you rise beyond, can we, can we begin, you know, maybe this is epi, all right, <clears throat> it's getting beyond this area, but you, you might say, and I'll stop with this, you might say um, that part of the task of religion by helping people to higher consciousness is, is, is epigenetic. As you begin to create new types of spiritual attitudes that would then be passed, uh, expressed in the genes in the next generation. Let's hope so, right? So maybe part of that is is epigenetic. At the present time, uh, uh, we know very clearly that there's a hate gene and um, people hate people of the other species and they're not empathic towards them, right? That's part of our, this weird God-given disposition, right? right? We'd have to adjust that to green. It's not a simple, it's not, it's not simple. This is, God's, this is God's world. What does this mean? What does it mean? Right? So it's an issue that a the, uh, theologically has to be taken up, that creating the image means that you hate someone who looks different from you. So, you know, God, right? So anyway, um, these things uh, can become part where religion reaches its highest potential and not an expression of the most primitive competition for space and likeness, which is when religion gives expression to the most primitive reptilian qualities that we have, which is the whole history, part of the whole history of religion and religious wars. But there's also a higher aspect, right? So, I mean, these dogmas that make people kill each other are not, um, they're expressed through genetic dispositions, but the dogmas are not genetic. Okay, so that, that's going in a slightly different direction, but you can see this is not a simple issue of a theology of creation where ethics comes in and what we're going to do about all this. But maybe we should hold that for a slightly different discussion but I'm not I'm not trying to dodge it and it's not it's not irrelevant it's absolutely fundamental if you want to call yourself a religious person in any sense right um, so part of the challenge of green is how much you're going to take into your mind how much you're going to take into your heart and what are you going to do about it okay that those are the three questions um, irrespective of the religious practice that you live. So then he would say part of the change of different theological categories is to get you to a place to think the best thought and feel the best feeling um, and do the best thing, which would be the most expansive and inclusive, inclusive, not what's the best for my survival necessarily. But it's, these are issues that you have to think about if you want to um, say that the, the, ethic, the ethical is grounded in a much larger theological enterprise, which is the more inclusive. So I'm not, I'm not justifying it, but I just want you to become aware as people who are growing and thinking and want to live a life of integrity that this is, part of, this is part of what it means to be an honest person, right? Uh, to recognize 
the ugliness of one's own religious or ethical position, or it's excluded. And then to, um, to find those places in the tradition that lead to the highest possibilities, not to the lowest. So let me um, turn, I just wanna just, uh, as the transition, we can see page 32. I wanna just, um, within this, uh, so a few lines down from the opening paragraph, he's been talking about our species is only, is only a couple of uh, millennia old, so we're just uh, little, little reptiles in this larger process. Don't get too uh, hoity-toity. It's, uh, you're really, the evolutionary process continues unabated. It's the evolving human brain, but also society, civilization. Okay, whether you think it's evolving or life on this planet in the last century is a devolution, um, I leave that to you. I think it's a, it's a good counter argument um, for devolution. Anyway, this evolutionary approach to the history of religion forms the background for the next section of the book my treatment of Jewish Western views of God. Right, so he's embedding a the, theological changes and transformations into this larger evolutionary um, structure, which I seek to address in the combined roles of scholar and seeker. So that's important because he's gonna say, it's not just one spiritual yearning, but it's going to include, um, you think about, the, by learning the history of religion in the university, let us say history of religions in the divinity school, right, whatever, you're, 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 you're getting a language of classification and conceptualization, but you're also realizing that theological ideas uh, are constantly changing. And they're changing by the way people reinterpret primary fundamental documents. And we have a responsibility for that, right? So he's trying to say, let's take a, a evolutionary or a historical view of changing theological notions within a scriptural based monotheism called Judaism, which is his, which is his sphere that he wants to think about and let's see how these theological notions change and what their consequences are. And he wants to, of course, say that you know, all roads lead to panentheism, but, um, but he thinks that that is, that is the divine command of the hour, that we live in one world, so a unitary world, that we live um, in a unitary world with different people and species, so that we have to create a global ethic, that we have to create a, an ethic of science that is inclusive. Um, we, we live in a world um, in which um, women's rights is not just a uh, bumper sticker, but it's a reality, um, and that, that so inclusion has to affect the religions and the cultures, right? in all the places where that's part of exclusion. So a theology of inclusion would include that too in different ways, in different, in different cultures, in different ways. So in other words, it's, it's, it, all roads lead to panentheism because um, he is um, he's speaking for an inclusivist theology, even though you are, you stand within your own particular tradition and language. Oh, that would be the larger goal, right? So the inclusivism means how do you include other people? How do you include other parts of the earth? Um, how do you include other species? How do you include other religions? How do you integrate all of that? So that's part of the challenge that is addressed to one's parochial theological position. Can you allow that to expand 
to be inclusivist, not inclusivist as just a catch term, but inclusivist as a lived spiritual ethical imperative, okay? We see what the product is for exclusivism and parochialism and um, the dogmatic hate between species and religion. We, we have good evidence of that. We have good evidence for that. So he's saying, how do you get unstuck from that, right? So he's trying to give you a larger theological way out that's not just treading water because you have nostalgia for this religious tradition or another. You know, you can stay stuck in exclusivist positions by treading water. You know, it may keep you afloat, but it doesn't get you anywhere. That's the problem with treading water. You don't drown, but you don't go anywhere. All right, enough for this preaching. <laughs> anyway, so here what he says, again, the thing that, which I seek to address is the combined roles of scholar and teacher. I do this out of conviction that the evolution of species and the evolution of religious ideas or the understanding of reality are continuous parts of a single evolutionary process. Right? It may implode, but if it implodes, it's because of you. Right? You have blocked the process of thinking the other as yourself. And you have the resources of your native tradition, he said, to do it, but you then have to let the best parts of the tradition transform the worst parts of the tradition. So he's, I hope to trace the following page. So, um, so this is a position that, I don't know the best way to say it. I mean, I think, well, um, he's green, is not looking over his shoulder about who on the right wing of orthodoxy is going to criticize him. Right? And he's not, so in other words, he's not, it's a, it's a theological position that's not looking for approbation. It's simply trying to um, speak a theological possibility. And that if you read that theology and it makes a difference from wherever you're coming from, whatever religious orientation, He's speaking out of that language of a postmodern Judaism, which is very complex, and its notion of normativity is complex, its notion of authenticity is not complex, but that's where it's coming from. But there's a much larger world, right? So um, part of this challenge is to get beyond very specific dogmatic notions of truth. My truth as opposed to your truth. But how can I have my truth, but I'm, you know, we all living in the same house. Right. So, um, they, there's one other notion he has on page 33 that I want to unpack. My act of meaning my insistence on speaking of and to the core of scientific reality in a religious manner is intended as an act of mythopoetic transformation, right? So using mythic images as, uh, as images for thinking, not as a, another form of cognitive, uh, you know, not as philosophical an analysis, but to think within certain kinds of religious images. A remythologization of the cosmos for our postmodern age. We'll have to come back to that. But uh, part of that much larger retrieval of mythology for the post, which in Europe is signaled by, um, uh, by Kassira and the whole revolution. And within America, the dominant place for this reconfiguration has been University of Chicago Divinity School and all of the people who have conceptualized about history of religion and, and myth and so on and so forth. So now let, let me um, 
I'm just trying to think of the best way to do this. It's, um, so there's no way I can go through the whole, let me, let me just sort of talk with you about some of these features and then maybe if there are a couple of pages that any of you have specifically, we can zero in. Because I want you to get a sense, why is he now giving us this history of God, God language? A Jewish history of God. Theology is this language of God terms. God talk, as the Bishop Ian Ramsey used to say, the Bishop of Worcester in England. God talk, that's what theology is, God talk, God, God talk. So what is, what is, God talk means that you're making certain kinds of conceptions, notions that are, begin with the Hebrew scriptures, but they have changed radically over 2000 years on the basis of reinterpretations that are either spawned by new religious experiences or new philosophical conceptions, which produce this radical transformation of what these old texts mean as something true, as something livable, as something believable, right? It's the same text, but Judaism and Christianity and Islam have um, each done a number on it, right? And that's a number of numbers, right? This uh, dance of the history of religion, which is sometimes good and sometimes insane. Okay, so um, one of the primary issues that Green brings from the beginning is that um, is to try to introduce two kinds of primary metaphors that would help you understand um, issues of the history of religion. So one primary metaphor is the vertical, right? The above as opposed to the below. That the above is separated from the below. That God is above and separate from the creation, distinct. The world is not God. The world is the creation of God. You have to ascend to, from the natural to the supernatural, supernatural in the literal sense, that which is above the natural. Not a, but here again, we're using our disposition as being upright creatures. Above, the supernatural means other than the natural, distinct. It could be within the natural, right? The, the soul is within the natural. So don't take this. That's again, we're getting caught in the above language of supernatural. Like it's not in some kind of a secret, um, palace in heaven where the supernatural, where that's somewhere, God knows how many billions of light years away, right? In another dimension, the 99th dimension, God knows. Okay. So we're talking about this notion of above and below, distinct. That distinction between God and the world results in distinctions in the world, right? God made divisions, distinctions, right? This versus that. Do this versus not that. Us versus them. All part of the distinctions, which are grounded in the monotheistic distinction that God is distinct from the world. There are ethical aspects to a theistic claim. That's not to say that some would not say that God who creates the world is creator of all creatures, but the practical way that this works out is an ever expanding series of distinctions that if you have if you have goodwill you might say that it's all part of the same divine creation and the same god but a lot of people don't have goodwill so this monotheistic god um, has his has favorites um, so that is this issue of above and below is an issue that deals with the notion of distinction and distinctiveness, right? It's part of this issue and then the special nature of the species that is in the image of God, whatever that means, right? The way 
any number of parts of the traditional understand what is the consequence of saying that the human being is some kind of a human um, uh, imago dei, whatever that could mean. Okay, right? So, right? It's not like it. It's not like we're little donkeys and God's the big donkey on the wall, and you pin your tail on the donkey, and now we're together, right? That's not what Imago Dei is. I hope. Anyway, so, but Green then begins to try to articulate is this, this history of religion, which includes then to say male patriarchy of the, of, right? Who is in and who is out? What is the nature of law and its relationship to re divine human relationship? Right. So these these become part uh, of that. Um, the vertical um, the vertical uh, dimension um, may include internal aspects, but it means only that God will be present as imminent in the world. So the vertical can include the imminent, but it's part of that same um, uh, chain and separation of difference. Um, there was one, yeah. I think there was one really lovely moment that um, I didn't quite realize how, how lovely it was until I went back and looked at it on page 35. Um, and here's again, it's a little bit of theological ledger domain of, of Green, because he's really importing his own theological conceptions into what he claims to be a more straightforward reading of scripture. So he's talking about God, at, there is the outside, and that's the above, and that's the distinct, and then there's us down here below. But he also wants to make as if, as it were, that there's already something of the inside that is the spiritual possibility that can grow. So if you look in page 35, he says, God can also be found within reality, especially within the human heart. So he's, he's, you know, he's creating his own history of religion here in a very uh, subtle way rather than above us in the heavens. And then he says the earliest pro statement about that, and this is his interpretation of it, but he's saying that the earliest statement of that is that in Deuteronomy, um, when, um, when Moses makes the claim, who will go up to the heavens to fetch it to bring it to us, as if the law is in the heavens, um, nor is it over the sea, but it's close within your mouth and hearts to be fulfilled. Now, obviously, um, someone's coming in. So obviously, within a theistic framework, part of the issue that's being discussed is the law is not simply something that you have to trend, you have to find in heaven, it's already been given on earth, and it's given to your hand and mouth to do here on earth, right? So he's really still speaking, the, the Deuteronomy is speaking in a theistic framework, right? It's not, the, the law is now is something that, that exists uh, on earth, but Green does something very interesting when he says that it's in your heart and mind to do, he is making a kind of mystical statement out of that. That the law is not simply outside, but there is an inner dimension of Torah and the law that's on the inside, and that that has to be cultivated. By making that move, he has moved away from the plain sense of the text to a more Hasidic reading of the text, but he's now allowing for the possibility that already within 
biblical scripture, there is already, as it were, in Nuche, in, in its core, this um, spiritual dimension that can be cultivated and can expand from within. Okay, so he, it's a very um, interesting. Now, as he moves through, he wants you to see that the images and the depictions of God as judge, God as father, God as king, are metaphorical depictions. They're part of the symbolic forms of expression. Right? He's taking a very different position here radically than if you read some of the footnotes of Soloveitchik when he's uh, criticizing uh, the Marburg theology, neo neo Kantian stuff of of Kassir and others, right? Who would say that part of the production of symbolic forms is a human projection of the imagination that we create symbolic forms of the imagination out of our creative consciousness. And Soloveitchik, because of his issues of objectivity and perhaps because of the Second World War says all that leads to is this kind of human efflatus that human beings are doing everything. And he dismisses this out of hand for all kinds of reasons. Green is starting from a very different position, acknowledging that the language of prayer or the Psalms or these depictions are constructions that emerge from our worldly experience and they are good for a particular world in which people live within kingship or any number of things. How do those things translate into another world? How do you reinterpret it? Well, so beginning with this, he wants you to understand the, the plastic, that's what he means by mythopoesis. Religious language is what, we, what people who talk about religious language, it, it's, it, it has a plastic quality. Like poetry, it has a plastic quality. Uh, it's malleable in relationship to the creative imagination. Because it's, it gives you a point of origination and it gives you a point of direction. Um, and if those can have sustaining power, they can be taken over as is or reinterpreted over a period of time. Um, now then Green says, okay, so there you have a very rich mythopoeic language insofar as God is effable, and we can talk about this, we talk about this through the symbolic forms of human images. And the rabbinic midrash takes this up to the kazoo. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge expansion of this mythopoeic creative imagination. So that you live within images. You're formed by images you create. Along come the philosophers from Philo to Maimonides. And they say, these images are cluttering your mind. These images are giving you a false consciousness. God is formless. God is imageless. You've turned the images into liturgical idols. What are you going to do about that? Well, if the real truth has to be understood, like Philo would say, in the light of Stoic philosophy or in the light of a certain type of Arist medieval Aristotelianism, as Maimonides would say, the real task is to find out what these images are allegories for. They're just allegories. They don't have substance. They're really the clothing of rational ideas. Right? They're really the allegories of the true philosopher's religion, which doesn't have images, but are really rational concepts and thoughts and things that get you to another place. And if, moreover, 
is saying if you go that route, you have thoroughly abstracted God beyond consciousness. How do you pray to a God like that? Who is impersonal and abstractly removed? Who's just thought thinking thought? If most people who follow my mind don't realize how radically, how radical the statements are. It doesn't, so how do you pray? Where is the commandment coming from? Moreover, the God becomes irretrievably distant in consciousness if God is only an idea. Where does the idea relate to my pain, my suffering, my acts of goodness? Right? Um, and moreover, the philosophical conception along this arc is absolutely static. God doesn't change. How could the one change? If God's, th if, if God's thought thinking thought, how can that change? Right? So the notion of care, change. So along comes in the 13th century as a counterpoint to Maimonides, the, the Kabbalah reemerges. And it's a rebirth of images. It's a rebirth of the mythic imagination. It's a rebirth of God who is pained, who cares, who's involved, who's both transcendent and imminent. And within the all of this um, Neoplatonic world, there is all this energy that you, all these life forms, all these thought forms, right? And the whole world of Kabbalah is trying to say how you can come in contact with that through scripture and the right reading of scripture that you can make contact with that. To make a longer story short, um, um, along comes the enlightenment and said, you know, fie on both your houses. Fie on both of your houses. Fie on the rationalists and fie on the, on the mythos, on the, on, on the mystical, because there's only emergent scientific truth. The only thing that you can measure, the only thing that's real is what you can speak about and measure. So science becomes the new Archimedean point or the new scale upon which everything is measured. You can't talk about it, measure it, doesn't exist. It's not real. So the conflict between science and religion is really a conflict between two methodologies of how do you relate to existence. If you reduce everything to the quantitative as opposed to the qualitative, then you've got a problem about religious reality, which doesn't seem to go away. That doesn't go away if you say that everything is reduced to a test tube. It doesn't go away. So how is it brought back into the game? How is that brought back in? So the enlightenment has op opened up this huge crisis and Kant didn't help by lowering the ceiling. So the ceiling drops down and it smashes you on the head. Right, there's no, it's, it, you know, it's, it's chicken licking. The sky is falling, the sky is falling and it falls. There's, an, there's no ceiling. It, and, it, and any notion that man is the measure, look what the ceiling fell down to. You're just a bunch of atoms and a bunch of lousy um, uh, instincts that you can't even control. Right? So along comes all the scientists and Freud. It's all junk coming up from your lowest self. Right? That's who you are, okay? You don't have a divine aspect. It's everything that's coming up from below.
Okay. And you try to construct an ethic out of that. Go ahead, challenge, right? What can I do? That's a good question that comes. What can you do if you're faced with that? Not a lot, right? So who are you responsible to if you can't even be cognitively in touch with your own responsibility? So it's a crisis. Um, and certain groups within Judaism sort of kept on their merry way because they weren't confronted by modernity, right? The Enlightenment didn't come to parts of Russia, it didn't come to Hungary, it didn't come to lots of places, so people continued their own merry way. And then the reptilian brain explodes in the 19th century, in the 20th century, in the wars and everything, and now people are looking around for some point of orientation, religion, right? So one of the, so there can be a whole series of types of retrievals, right? In America, let us say, Jewish religious theological life in America, right? What is the retrieval? You try to retrieve the lost world of Europe, right? You wanna retrieve the true American democracy and import that in? Right, that was the underlying statement of the conservative movement in the 50s and 60s. This is the fullest expression of Judaism is really um, the truth that John Adams never said. Okay, democracy, progress, da da da. Okay. So you're left with a series of unanswered questions. Um, this the neo-Hasidism that begins in the end of the 19th century with people like Buber and um, Hillel Zeitlin and the Yiddish writers like Yud Lamed Peretz are saying, look, there is this other cultural re resource that can transform the dead forms of religious ideas and rationality and give it a different kind of mythopoeic infusion. Maybe it's not for everybody, but these are part of Renaissance movements, the same ways you could have, you have ethical movements that were developing, Zionist movements, different kinds of highly, um, the Musar movement of, of radical, radical aesthetic ethics and so on and so forth are all attempts to regenerate new theological life into what was um, um, not, once, once the enlightenment happens and the Jew was able to move into Western society, right? They have to make choices of how do you live within Western society. So do you just take off all of your clothes and put on the clothes of the of Christian Europe? Is that the way that you assimilate, which is an assimilation of mind and spirit? Or can you find a resource for this rebuilding? Right? Right. How do, the, how do all of these things come into play that the tradition of observance and the whole legacy of 2,500 years can be given a new voice, right? So people try to find, what we say, the dominant genetic strand. So faced with this kind of an issue, let's say the reform movement, focuses on ethical monotheism, right? That was the beginning, from the beginning of the 19th century, right, into the 50s and 60s. It's a, it's a rational ethical monotheism in which the prophets, not the lawgiver of Moses, but the prophets who are speaking about prophetic ethical values is the dominant genetic strain. Right? 
and that will become the way that one can live the tradition um, in a complex new world that makes all kinds of challenges, especially when people don't know the language of tradition and are not observant and don't know the, um, the traditions themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Conservative movement is making its own kind of accommodation during this period, but trying to find that middle ground of language. So in those days, it was called tradition and change. That was the banner term. How much tradition, how much change? How do you, how do you juggle this in the circus of religious life, right? This ball goes up, this ball goes down, right? Within this whole new possibility of brokenness and reconstruction, right? The neo Hasidic influence remains as a kind of backwater issue. Um, until it kind of reemerges in America with Heschel, who wouldn't, who didn't, who refused to absolutely, absolutely identify it, identify with it, but through a number of his students, it becomes another language. And now with Green, it becomes coordinated with this larger openness to the whole, it, the inclusive notion of the world that God is the all. It allows a certain kind of accommodation to Zen uh, and to Vedanta um, and to share in the project of living in one world in an inclusive sense, but within your own spiritual language. So it's an attempt to preserve one's language without being exclusivist or parochial. So, um, I'm trying to remember. Um, um, so there's a phrase, uh, um, Green, um, I had just recently had to write the blurb of a new collection of essays that he did. And he sort of begins the book, I'm trying to remember exactly, it was, it, it's like, I am a non-traditional, observant neo-Hasidic Jew who's open to Eastern religion, something like that. Right. But he's not saying this so that one would trivialize this as syncretism. The challenge is, can you, can you ground yourself? That's why I began the whole lecture. Where do you, where's your starting point? So the starting point is, your own native language, your own tradition, then how do you begin to integrate all these other modalities that you can live, that they become forms of expression, they become forms of truth, forms of authenticity, right? And for people within that world like Green and others, part of the language that Rosenzweig spoke about when he used the language of Hegel. So the language is very simple. It's called not yet. Okay, I do this, but not, I, I don't do that, not yet. Now there's, there's a notion that one wants to grow into the tradition, but I'm not ready, not yet. It doesn't make a claim on me yet, but I'm standing in readiness, right? So. In this kind of framework, the commitment is the commitment of readiness. But the actualization is the hyphen of the not yet. Right? The not yet of theological assertion. The not yet I can't do this practice. The not yet of this belief. But there is a new commitment to a framework of what would work. Now, I'm not, this is Green's theological position because he wants now what also comes in through the front door and the back door through Kabbalah neo Hasidism is the divine dimension of God, the feminine dimension of God, which is now translated in any number of ways from the Kabbalah into Hasidism as the Shekhinah 
and then it takes on a new form in neo Hasidism, right? Um, so the the masculine and the feminine uh, become two sides of the human heart, as they're two sides of the divine spirit, right? So the same male and female created he them in Genesis is really the two sides of being in the image of God is being in touch with your masculine side or your feminine side, or male, female are included, or uh, all the people. So now there's, there's an attempt to move towards a religiosity of inclusiveness that would include, as we'll see in subsequent things, uh, what it means to live on the earth and to respond to other people. But all of this is part of the reconstruction. It's a reconstruction. Right? It's not reconstructionism, which is a, a dimension of Judaism, of, of, a, of, a, of a radical naturalism with Mordechai Kaplan. Green, at one point in his life, was the rector of that seminary, but this book is a more theological naturalism. It's a theological naturalism. He, he, he takes it way beyond what Mordechai Kaplan um, was able to articulate. Because Mordechai Kaplan, um, saw Judaism as a footnote to Thomas Dewey when he was teaching them at the University of Chicago of reconstruction and philosophy. So you have to see, that's why the I voice is fundamental for the theological project. All you, after Kant or after the crisis, what would be the measure of truth, right, right, how, so it becomes my experience, let's say, of the tradition, my experience and reinterpretation of scripture, et cetera, et cetera. So these become theological um, flare points. So by giving us a history of God, that is to say, a history of the hermeneutical diversity of images of God, which are 2,000 years of multiple interpretations of scripture. The question then comes, where do you locate yourself if you want to be in this game on the spectrum? Rational halachic only, mystical, Hasidic only, ethical only. What do you take in from the outside, right? So it's a crisis of modernity, but it's a crisis of modernity that's facing modernity in a different way, right? Can you talk about revelation and biblical criticism, which will be an issue that he'll try to confront um, next week, or you know, with part, with next week, and which Heschel hints at but dodges completely and isn't, isn't even on the agenda for um, Soloveitchik. He trivializes it in two sentences at the beginning. I never was bothered by this, right? Deus dixit, and that's where we, and that, now, now, now the game is on. God said this, thus said the Lord. Right? Deus dixit, thus is the Lord, and Heschel then says, all that we can say about the revelations God spoke, the rest is commentary, right? Totally different positions, like two different sides of the universe. Two different sides of the theological universe. Deus dixit means, okay, now that's the background, now let's talk about the foreground, right? And God spoke, for Heschel is, that's the mystery of presence. That's all that you can say about the mystery of presence. And Green will try, and other things, is a, is a challenge of this in terms of what revelation consists of. That is to say, what is God and what is, what, what is of God and what is of the human in revelation, okay? Rosenzweig addressed that directly. Right? Right? 
Maimonides had to confront that in a more Aristotelian way. Right? Or you can bracket the issue and talk about a lot of other things. So, it's a, so what I want you to begin to see is that the part of the projects of theology are part of the projects of reconstructing a modern or postmodern religious framework of authenticity that you can live in authentically. Tradition as given, but we interpreted authentically, but now the part overweigh, overweighs the whole. The, the whole is only the notion that I am in readiness for the whole but not necessarily the way it came down before. I'm ready for the whole, but now in my own mode of approximation. You see? So if you have to see theology as those issues that I talked about at the beginning, right? Self-authentication, self-actualization, translation, appropriation, and this mysterious notion which now substitutes for divine providence called emergence, right? It's really a cagey way to deal with providence. But what, what can you do? What can you do in this world? Unless you want to only talk in medieval language, right? So, so, th so this is an attempt to be honest and forthright and committed at the same time. And then you say, which is the dimension of the tradition or parts of it um, that you move with? Stolovechik is dealing also with an issue of trying to impart what he believes to be the sustainable value and commitment of of a normative um, halachic position. Heschel comes to America and he would, not, he would never have spoken this way in Europe. No one would have listened to him. It's, not, it's an American way of talking, right? Even the way Soloveitchik talks when he does the essays in the 60s, he's now already talking like an American. He's not talking the way he talked in the 40s in those books. And Green, emerges as another moment. And within this spectrum, of course, was all the feminist theology that was emerging in the 60s and 70s that was trying to redress the balance. I remember that so well, right? Because when voices first begin to appear, they become strong, They're, they have to assert themselves. This is long before women began to study and were given a place at the table, right? So America is this strange context that's in part the West, it's in part now includes the East, and it also includes a smorgasbord of what people pick up through all kinds of trivial uh, self-help books. So. When you're writing a theology, like who's the audience? You're not writing a theology for the committed observant Jew. You're not writing a theology for a person who's knowledgeable. You're also trying to reach out to people whose um, emotional life is, is broken, whose theological life is alien to themselves, and they don't have a language. America, so, and we all share that, even though, even if any one of you are committed, I certainly share it, and I'm probably as much committed as anybody in, on the gallery. So this, this notion of the fragmentation, of alienation, of appropriation, um, is where the rubber hits the road at every point of performance, practice, prayer, observance, mental considerations, right? So what a theologian tries to do is to bring this to the cognitive surface. 
right? And it can make you uncomfortable or make you just throw it out and say, this is not authentic, right? So who, you're saying that it's not authentic, right? Who's authentic that's saying that it's not authentic? That's an old Yiddish joke, right? Who's the authentic person saying it's not authentic? So it emerges from, many of you probably have read the, the, the powerful book that was done in the 60s about people like Rilke and Nietzsche, The Disinherited Mind, right? That's, that's the modern mind, the disinherited mind. And the, the, the theology is trying to say, because people are yearning for an inherited mind. But so how do you negotiate this um, honestly, without being a hypocrite? but yet wanting to be committed, right? You can't jump in to the inherited mind, right? Unless you wanna shed your identity and become a true believer, right? Or become a certain kind of what's called a reversion, a Baal Teshua. So then you, you become, you turn yourself inside out and conform to the expectation of that. So that, that person who is, uh, returns um, in faith. So uh, let me, as long as I use that term, Baal Teshuvah, uh, and then maybe this will be a nice one, Karen, then I'll take about 10 minutes of questions. So technically speaking, in religious terms, a Baal Teshuvah means a person who has turned back to God, right? A Jew who's turned back to God, was, was alien, you know, uh, and now come back, the, et cetera, et cetera. But the pun is to be a Baal Teshuvah means to be a person who has the answers, a Teshuvah, you have the answers. And so there's a whole group of contemporary Jews who say, I'm not a Baal Teshuvah, I'm not a person who has the answer. I'm a, um, I'm a Sho'el bit Teshuvah, I'm coming back with questions. Right? And that's part of that modern issue that's underlying these types of theological moments. We're, we're coming, you, how do you bring your question into a normative framework to live with authenticity? Because you, it's a catch-22. You have to jump in somewhere and do something. Or else you're always on the outside asking questions. And that's part of the disinherited mind. So let's take, a, we have about five or six minutes, let's take a couple of quick questions and we'll continue with this next time. But I think a lot of what I'm trying to do is help you get on the inside of this theology so that you can begin to see what's at stake. Why is it being done? Um, why, does it, why does it matter for some people, right? And so you can at least Put this on the map of your spiritual horizon. Okay, so anybody want to say something or maybe you can save it for your prompt paper. Fishbane, jump in a lake. I don't. I wonder if no one else has a question. I want to. Yeah, well, let's I see, to first, let me see first if anybody. Yeah, yeah. Who's not uh, auditing? Anybody? First, um, anything, I guess no one wants to say it. <laughs> All right, keep it to yourself, keep it to yourself. Yeah. In your isolation, turn, work on it, work on it. But you can write me a prompt paper um, where this hits the road, right? It's, pretend you're writing to your diary. Dear diary, this is nonsense, right? Well, dear diary, maybe this is something I can think about here. Okay, dear Abby. Okay, whatever. However, whoever you want to adjust yourself to. All right, we we have the we have the our Romanian Sufi. Where did you go, Adrian? Oh, there uh, you go. You disappeared. Okay. <laughs> the, about the place of experience in Green's life even, right? Because I know you, you're very close to him. I remember he came to the Divinity School once uh, when there was the, the launching of the Zohar, the Pritzker edition. Mm 
Um, so what, what is the place of experience in his view of things? It, it seems that he, experience is, religious experience or practice is that big thing missing in, in this entire account, right? Everything, uh, is expressive. That, Everything that he's talking about is expressive of his articulation of his experience. And only saying what he can truly authentically affirm. Yeah, but I mean religious experiences, or, or I, maybe I'm using the wrong word, uh, religious practice. I should, someone who's, let's say, sticking to, and, and, and in a way, in, immersed. Uh, uh, I think, let, all right, so if that's a bigger issue. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll wait till okay. next time. It becomes the issue of what is the sense of commandedness in this theological framework, right? What is the sense of, not just obligation, right? That's one way of talking about it, but what is the sense of commandedness in this worldview, not the sense of commandedness in the sense from, from Soloveitchik's point of view. What is the sense of divine, of the commandedness of the, of the tradition, right? What is the commandedness? Um, and then, so in other words, why do you perform the commandments? What is the, what is the, um, what is the imperative of the commandments in this worldview? And how can you pray? To whom do, would you pray? Well, the Hasidic master didn't have a problem with that, and Green doesn't have a problem with that. But we have to talk about how you do that in postmodern times. So it's not easy, but I will I get you down there now. Okay, Romanians keep moving around. Okay. Um, but so that's, I'm not trying to dodge the issue, um, but however that worked in a mystical or Hasidic framework, it has added complications if you're living in the world that we're living in, which is you don't deny the postmodern crisis of what it means to think and believe and to live. So the whole notion, and maybe I'll end with this, the whole notion of normativity is not just an abstract question, right? It's an issue that you have to face every time you're doing an action. What is the, where are the norms located? Where are they located? And what is the nature of normativity in your life? So that becomes a theological question for a postmodern Jewish theological position. Um, and it's the beginning of a conversation so in this kind of world, and with this I'll end, um, to a certain degree, you can't talk to everybody, right? There's a lot of people in the same Jewish, you can't, you can't talk to. It may be easier for a person to talk to a Buddhist than maybe a certain kind of Orthodox Jew. So the part of the, Part of the issue for the postmodern theological person is who is your dialogue partner? How do you construct, how do you live within a community? Um, so these are, these are challenging issues. There's no simple answer. And I'm not trying to give a simple, I'm not, I hope I'm not trying to pretend that this is a simple answer. Um, but that is all of what generates the anxiety for people like Green or myself who are religious people, but can't deny all of that which subverts an easy stance, if you're going to be honest, right? All right, uh, hope you're 
get through the day, go for a walk like I'm going to do, um, and um, stay healthy. Send me your papers um, and uh, find some nice people to talk to. Okay? Until I see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well.